White Sox podcast coming to you live from Studio A of our CHGO offices here in the West Loop of Chicago. I'm your host, Sean Anderson. Alongside me, the full CHGO White Sox crew. That's Vinny Duber, our CHGO White Sox beat writer. You can follow him at Vinny Duber. The man in the middle is Herb Lawrence. Hello. You can follow him at Wall 23 He's our CHGO White Sox community leader. And you can follow me at Sean underscore W underscore Anderson. You can follow the show at CHGO underscore White Sox. And we're being produced today by... Old friend, old pal, formerly Mr. Hockey, and now Mr. Football. Hey, guys. It do, it good to be back. It's good Mr. to be back. Mr. Football doesn't sound Steven, right. Steven, when will you be Mr. Baseball again, though? I don't know. Wow, never. I that will, was I a never, be, Sean. Be, yeah. That's what I heard. I'll yeah. be on Sox postgame shows occasional Sundays. Occasional don't, Sundays? Yes. Ooh. Occasionally Mr. Baseball. Don't yeah. hold your breath. Yeah. will become Mr. Seriously. Baseball. Is there a Mr. Football? Obviously, Mr. Hockey is Gory Howe. Is there a Mr. Well, Base- Mr. Baseball is Tom Selleck. Yes. Yeah, but... It's a movie. Mr. Baseball is a movie yes. starring Tom Selleck. Great uh, mustache. Mr. Football. No, I don't think so. There's Mr. Food. Who's that? Channel 7 uh, food critic back in the day. Well, mm. chef, really. I could be a Mr. Food. Mr. Food. My is that old, how he talked, or did they have like a, a, like a that, Bob Rorman? No, that's how Joe Daly, the uh, anchor, would uh, introduce him every day. I'm old. I used to watch the news, and I still actually do watch the news. Our guy Jim says, Mr. Baseball is Willie Mays. Is that an official... Is no, that no, is that an no. official? Jim is shaking his head. No, no it's not an no. official. He's nickname. just appointing him. Who's who? Who would be Mister Baseball? Think on it. You don't have to answer it right now. You know hey, well, who? Bob Euchre. Don Don Mattingly. Jim says Bo- Bob Euchre. Bob Euchre. Yeah, but Bob Euchre wasn't good at baseball. Gordy Howe was that's, like that's the point. one of the best of all time. He wasn't good at baseball at all. He's been in baseball for like eighty years, and he played an um, actor in multiple things. Mister Belvedere and. Major League. You're leading with Mr. Belvedere. <laughs> I mean, great acting there. I think he was on that. Some great acting right there. Um, yeah, I, I don't I don't hate Willie Mays. Uh, hit that thumbs up button, though. Uh, good to see Jim hanging out with us. We also got Midwest Rippin' and uh, Brett hanging out. Uh, so uh, if you haven't hit that like button, hit that like button. And I know Steven's got a goal of, what, 54,000 54, YouTube subscribers by NFL Draft Day, which is one week from today. And how many away are we? Uh, we are less than 200 away. So oh, we could do that by the end of the show. Let's go, guys. <laughs> Let's try. You heard so it, man. Let's do it. Hit subscribe. that subscribe button. Hit that like button. We'd appreciate it. Uh, we're going to talk today about how Chris Getz can try to turn this ship around. And not only just in the short term, not only just patch a couple, you know, leaks, right? How can we make this a fully functioning ship that will never sink, right? How do we make this the, ti- well, the Titanic sunk? Uh, yes. The Lusitania? Oh, no, that one sunk too. The Hindenburg. You're going to go with the main that next? Was, that's not a boat. That's not a boat. Still that's an airship. Still sunk. to work. <laughs> it's, it's a rigid airship. It sunk from the air. <laughs> um, so The uh, humanity. <laughs> we'll talk about the short-term and long-term fixes for the White Sox. And then we'll also preview the Phillies that they have coming up. Uh, that's a Friday, Saturday, Sunday matchup. Looking forward to uh, Zach Wheeler and uh, Aaron Nola pitching against the White Sox. Should be fun. Uh, short-term fix. Maybe don't face really good teams with really good pitching because... I don't think that bad hitters could hit good pitching from what I would I all my baseball research. That's what my baseball research tells me is bad hitters do poorly against good pitchers. Well, they're not going to fix that in the very short term because uh, the Phillies are throwing three good ones at them this weekend. Yeah, I think um, the White Sox are making pitchers who probably are mediocre to good look great. I know Seth Lugo has been decent in the last couple of years, but they're making that man look like Cy Young. Same thing with Michael Walker. Like, just some bad at bets. So, yes, there's some good pitchers out there that are making the White Sox look bad, but I think the rest of the league's going to adjust to Seth Lugo and Michael Walker and say, this is not that hard. Why, why are you having difficulties with this? One, well, mostly, too, I think even though the sample size of this point in the season is very small for a lot of things it's large enough that we know that right now 
the White Sox problem is not that they are the onslaught of, of great arms. And that's nothing against those guys. These at bats and these results are carrying over night after night after night. Uh, you know, and so I, I don't think it has really anything to do with who they're facing right now and more to do with what they're doing themselves what they maybe are capable of doing themselves, uh, but certainly the fixes are not in the schedule. Uh, they are in um, trying to figure out how they, these guys who some of them have had pretty good success at this level before, can either rediscover that or for some of them discover it for the first time. Is I'm trying to think, like, besides Tyrick Skubal, is there a real top-of-the-rotation starter that the White Sox have faced and have either done well or struggled against? I, I don't remember anybody. Reynaldo Lopez. Stop. I mean, he is doing well, mm. but he's not. He's at the bottom of their... <laughs> Been doing very well. He's at the bottom <laughs> of their rotation. I mean, the Cleveland thing is nothing. The Kansas City thing, we've skipped Cole Reagans both times. Didn't have to face Hunter Green. Didn't have to face Spencer Strider before he got hurt. So, like... <laughs> this is the test this weekend. We might get no hit twice versus these guys. They're going to no, uh, no Johnny Vandermeer, the White Sox? Yeah. It's going to be tough, man. Uh, <laughs> it looks up to pummel all our pitchers, too, except for Garrett Crochet, of course. And I guess that's the one thing that you know sticks out is we've seen the Sox get fairly decent pitching from – you know, they're starters. I know, obviously, people hate Chris Flexen. Now he's been apparently flexed to a bullpen roll, uh, an 878 ERA in three starts. Soroka hasn't been fantastic, an ERA na- near seven, but he hasn't been bad in all four of those games. Fetty with a 310 ERA, Crochet with a 357 ERA, and then, obviously, we've seen two back-to-back starts from the rookies in Jonathan Cannon and Nick Nostrini, and both of them look well. So it doesn't seem like pitching is the issue. Uh, there's some bullpen names I think will get some moans and groans from White Sox fans like Tim Hill and uh, Dominic Leone, but I'll Outside of that, Michael Kopech's been fairly effective. Davey Garcia has been effective when he's not walking guys. Steven Wilson's been affecting people. Jordan Leisure hasn't given up a run. So the pitching really doesn't seem to be in a fixing place, and it seems like what fixes they are making are Mike Clevenger, and he'll be here soon, right? Yeah, I mean, if we're talking about what in the very short term of this one season uh, needs to be addressed for the White Sox is very clearly what wasn't addressed during the offseason, right? And that's the offense. Um, Obviously, they brought in a couple of new hitting coaches. Uh, They were positive in one way or another on some of the guys they brought in. They liked what Dominic Fletcher did in the major leagues last year. They liked the track record, if you want to call it that, of Paul DeYoung. Maybe it's should be more described as just past success because hasn't really been super consistent. But uh, the, even the guys they brought in who were very clearly brought in for defensive reasons, they did have some compliments to give toward their offensive capabilities. Uh, but team-wide right now, and certainly injuries to arguably your top two hitters in Robert and Moncada that are going to knock them out for a long time uh, aren't helping. But team-wide right now, it's, it's looking kind of ugly. Uh, certainly uh, the Andrews stand out as guys who – were supposed to be part of the reason that the offense would be okay, right? Or could be okay, I guess. When when the, when Chris Getz goes out and adds DeYoung, Lopez, Maldonado, and Fletcher, guys that we're not expecting to do a ton offensively, the onus is on the guys who were here, those other five guys, Eloy, Moncada, Robert, Vaughn, and Benintendi, to figure things out for themselves and pick up not the slack necessarily, but carry the load here for the offense. Um, That hasn't happened yet. For three of those guys, it's been health-related. They haven't been able to play very many games. Um, and But the other two guys, the two Andrews, have struggled mightily. Uh, and, you know, they're they're fortunate they've gotten something from Gavin Sheets. It's the reason they won the won a ball game yesterday. Um, and uh, they're, they're fortunate to uh, maybe see Paul DeYoung turning a little bit of a corner with a really good day yesterday. But um, it's... It's Benintendi and Vaughn who not only need to pick up from the guys who are injured, need to pick up for themselves, but those are two guys who are probably going to be here past the end of this year. If you're talking about long-term stuff too, those two guys are where a focus should be. Moncada and Aloy might be in their final years as White Sox with those expensive team options coming up, but Benintendi and Vaughn don't figure to be going anywhere. No, and I, you bring up Gavin Sheets. Where would this offense, where it's at right now, I think way behind everybody else in the major leagues. I think uh, they've got like 34 RBI or run scored this year, and the second closest is like 58. And so where would the White Sox be without a person they weren't going to be counting on this year in Gavin Sheets? We didn't even know if he was going to make the roster. Exactly. <laughs> and Robbie Grossman, too. Like, that guy's getting on base at a good clip. And if they didn't have those two guys, this offense would be even more woeful. That 
that's hard to believe because if those guys did their regular every day back of the baseball card numbers, it would be very, very bad for the White Sox, even worse than it is right now. So thank God for Gavin Sheets, what he did yesterday for the game winning home run and what he's doing this year where he's kind of retooled his swing. And you guys can read more. Nvidia's article. If you are a CHEO diehard, there you go. Uh, yeah, I, I need to write my apology letter to Gavin Sheets with all the times that people were like, "Trade Gavin Sheets in the chat," and I was like, "Oh, what is he going to be driving Dylan Cease to Cle- uh, Baltimore?" <laughs> well, I mean, to I was be wrong, but to be fair, like in the off season, and I think Gavin would probably agree with you on some level. Like, what had he done from a production standpoint to to deserve anything but that? Right? I mean, not necessarily being ridiculed, but I suppose the point being, you know, that like his his Production level up to up to that point was you were you were re- reacting to that, and he was the one who was telling me that hey he wasn't confident last year he he knew he wasn't playing like he thought he could he had to go make a bunch of changes do a bunch of work in order to get to a point where you're saying you know oh my bad for in the off season because I don't think anybody saw this coming and uh, you know good for Gavin for going to work and 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 believing in himself but certainly. As I just said to Herb, we didn't even know that he was going to be able to beat out Mike Moustakis for a roster spot on opening day, and he's turned into their only reliable bat right now. Yeah, and here we are. Look at him. Uh, hitting the hell out of balls, and he's really the only one who's doing it. The White Sox are 30th in baseball in way to runs created plus. Uh, they're at 67. The Miami Marlins are at 68. The Minnesota Twins and Detroit Tigers are at 80, 81. So, like, those are the – there's, like, 20% difference between – Miami and the White Sox being the worst, and then what, what? who's 28th and 27th? So there is a pretty big crater there. And there was an interesting stat that they're not swinging and chasing as much, but they have no ability to hit the ball hard. So what the biggest issue I think One of those had, things is good. Yeah, right. What the biggest <laughs> issue with the White Sox has been those chase rates, those strikeouts, basically feeling like every inning is nine pitches and you know the other opponent is just getting an easy, light workout in, right? The White Sox have been a little bit more disciplined and have been, you know, n- less chasey, but they just can't do any damage. Uh, a 196 batting average. Ugh. I've heard that's bad as a team. Uh, a 269 on base percentage. Oh so Christ. where would that be if that wasn't for Robbie Grossman? And a 302 slugging percentage, which is 20 percent, uh, 20 points worse uh, than the second worst team in the Miami Marlins. A 302 slugging compared to a 322 slugging. So it's just been horrendous. Is the short term fix? Tommy Pham, and maybe Gavin Sheets tells everyone not to worry as much? I mean, Tommy Pham is part of that short-term fix. I think the I, I, I still think that the main short-term fix is some of these guys who are here figuring things out, right? I mean, you want to see the guy who's on the screen right now, Aloy Jimenez, start hitting the ball in the air a little bit more. He's only been back up for a couple of days. And, and by the way, on base uh, – on base stuff looks all right. Yeah. A few walks yesterday. That was that you know he looked he looked like he was doing something right there. But he's got to get the ball in the air. He's got to hit the ball for power. That's why he's in the middle of the lineup is to do something like that. And he said you know that was the focus of the off season was getting that done. Okay, let's see the results of that of that focus. Um, he's got to show up. Vaughn's got to show up. Ben Intendi has to do something, man. Because I mean, and, and I'm not even you know talking about the. Sean Anderson, Andrew Benintendi drinking game. But what I am talking about is he does not look very good at all right now, really in any facet. No. Um, uh, you know, the, the defense has gone from, uh, you know, you had you had numbers to back it up. It's gone from now very noticeable just watching it that he's not getting to a lot of balls. Um, and and obviously the, uh, the offense is not there either. So he's got to figure out something to do because he's not leaving this lineup. He's not going anywhere. Uh, he's going all over it. You know, Pedro Grafol, I think, looks at him as a guy who probably uh, has the ability to hit anywhere. I, I don't think he sees him as, okay, well, you know, he started the season as the on-base guy. He doesn't have to stay there like we saw a, a few years ago. Tim Anderson was struggling, but he was an on-base, or he was a first, uh, a leadoff man, right? He was in that top spot in the order, and that's that was his thing. He needed to be there. Andrew Benintendi probably has a little bit more lineup versatility than that, but you're seeing Pedro exhaust that lineup versatility in trying to find him a place where he can thrive. Is there been talk about where he feels most comfortable? Because it seems like maybe that might be the fifth spot, but now with the injuries, he's been maybe forced into that second spot. If we see when Robert Moncada Aloy are fully healthy, 
Does he return to the second spot when those guys are there? Does he stay at the fifth spot? Is there been talk about that? Uh, not really. And I, I, I do think, though, that that is a positive, right? I mean, I think if you were to ask him, he's the kind of guy who probably has that mindset of, I'm going to try to do my thing no matter where I am in the lineup. And I think that that is a positive, not necessarily a negative of, oh, you've got to search and find for where he goes. I think, it, I think it's more of a, he probably has as good of a chance to break out one through nine, right? Because he's probably going up there trying to do the same thing. Um, but it, it obviously just isn't working right now. Uh, you know, for a guy who spent last year seeing those kinds of results, but it was very explainable in terms of he was injured, right? He had a hand injury that carried over from last year. He got hit in the hand early in the season. Uh, right now, there's nothing else. You know, he is fully healthy, and there's nothing else to say other than, wow, he's not feeling it, and he's not – uh, having the success that I think anybody in that organization thought he would have. Um, but, man, he's got to figure it out because so much of that lineup, you know, especially with Robert and Moncada out for weeks and months still, so much of that lineup depends on him. I just think it has to do, like you were talking with Gavin Sheets, I'm sure that last year's struggles, even with the hand problem, are on this year with Andrew Benintendi because – while we've seen him not play well, we know he's not this guy. Like, he's not this bad. The same thing with Andrew Vaughn. Like, they have played well below where they're supposed to play at this point. So I just think it's a confidence thing where they don't believe they can do the things that they have shown in their careers that they can do. Because I know, Sean, that, you know, Andrew Benintendi is not one of anybody's favorite White Sox, but... Did you even in your own wildest dreams, your wildest nightmares, think that he would be this bad? Like, he's actively hurting the White Sox. I think he's a negative, like, .5 war player this year. Like, he's not this guy. So he needs to get out of his own head and do whatever he needs to do in Boston where he was actually a good player or the one year in Kansas City where he made an all-star. And get back to that thinking because I think the whole – White Sox struggling, him struggling last year, he signed the biggest contract in White Sox history, is all weighing on his shoulders, and this is the result of all that. Steven, can you put the one cam on me? I mean, uh, Herb, can you re-ask that question? Just mainly, like, did I think that Andrew Benatendi would be this bad? Sean, did you think that Andrew Benatendi would be this bad? Yes. Let's take a break, and we'll let you know about our fantastic sponsors like Ray CDJR and Lining Google. Uh, what? I tweet. I, I let right, you know. Do I let you know right. before they even signed him. I'll take any other outfielder besides this I guy. Know that. I'll take Joey Gallo on a one-year deal. I'll take Brandon Nimmo for five years. There's no way you I'll, thought this. I'll bad. take Michael T A. Taylor. Oh, I. I All right. We'll get you to know, it. you were talking about going back to Boston. What do you need? to time machine. You need to go talk to Doc Brown. And get that DeLorean <laughs> up to 88 miles per hour. Like, I mean, what are you talking about? You can't go back and just be magically 24. I know that one weird freak is trying to do it. Brian Johnson, uh, who is. The most funny guy to do that, the guy that's, like, turning, like, as pale oh, as possible, yeah, seen, yeah. trying to, like, recycle his blood. It's yeah. very weird, look rich like guy stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It's weird. Anyways, look up Brian Johnson. I really don't Tech want Mogul. to. Not the full uh, line. That, that, that's what Andrew Benatendi needs to get back that Boston magic. Are you in the market for a new vehicle? If you are, then we have some great news for you. Our partner, Ray Chrysler Dodge Jeep and Ram in Fox Lake is celebrating the Jeep Celebration event all month long. And you know what that means? You'll be able to rave about their savings on a wide selection of inventory. For a limited time, lease a new 2024 Jeep Grand Cherokee Laredo Altitude for $439 a month for 39 months. And if that Grand Cherokee isn't big enough for you, check out the third row and lease a new 2024 Jeep Grand Cherokee Limited L for $479 a month for 39 months. At Ray CDJR, you'll always be able to shop one of Chicagoland's largest inventories and drive home with more money in your pocket than you'd expect thanks to Ray's price promise. So don't miss out. Shop great deals all month long and save big because Ray CDJR makes buying a new vehicle more affordable than ever. And that's not all. Just for listening to CHGO, you can get a free oil change when you mention CHGO at the service center or mention CHGO when you book online at Ray CDJR slash service, but you have to schedule before April 30th. So if you are in the market for a new vehicle, then you have to check out the team at Ray Chrysler Dodge Jeep and Ram because they are the only team we recommend. Visit them today on Route 12 in Fox Lake. For more information, visit Ray CDJR in Fox Lake or RayCDJR.com. Serving the community since 1963. I don't know if you've been outside today, but not, you know, not the greatest day. It's in the 50s. It cooled down a little bit. 
But there's one way you can always bring the sunshine, and that's by uh, opening up a nice summer shandy. Line and Kugels makes a delectable beverage. And listen, it's not just bringing sunshine to your taste buds, guys, because it even brought sunshine to a certain White Sox fan yesterday. Uh, Steven, if you've got the graphic uh, for you, uh, I tweeted yesterday during game one about Paul DeYoung's two-run home run. And here's our guy, Luke, who's always watching, Luke. saying – it happened because he's drinking a shandy for the game today. Let's go. Every, it, it brings sunshine wherever it goes. It's just part of the fantastic roster of Line and Kugel's beers, of course. You can have yourself a berry vice. You can have yourself a honey vice with real Wisconsin honey made by real Wisconsin bees, Herb. Thank you. You can even go north of the north of the border and get yourself a Liney's original if you happen to be up in Wisconsin. But summer shandy, of course, is our favorite, and you can do it. You can drink it rather for all of your favorite summertime activities: picnic by the lake, tailgate at the rate, canoeing up on uh, Lake Whatever Agon up in Wisconsin. Uh, a summer shandy is the perfect. Uh, thing to pair with that. So, guys, flavors life's simple moments with Lining Kugels. It's the official craft beer of your Chicago White Sox. Go to liney.com slash chgo to find delivery options near you. That's l-e-i-n-i-e dot com slash chgo. Or pick up Lining Kugels pretty much anywhere they sell beer. Lining Kugels, flavor of the moment. Celebrate responsibly. The Jacob Lining Kugel Brewing Company, Chippewa Falls. Yes! yes. Uh, last time Andrew Benatendi pulled an extra base hit was... 2023. No. Well, yeah, 2023. I was right. Good job, Herb. <laughs> um, August of two, 2023. Yeah, you're close. September 17th. Mm. So it's it's been a while. Uh, off Sunny Gray. There you go. Was it over 100 miles per hour? No, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. Yeah, no, it wasn't. Uh, it was a gapper, though, and I missed those. I mean, anything. I'd take anything. I mean, he's got one hit that has actually reached right field this year. Yeah. You just can't even pull singles. Like, I... What do you do here? I'm telling you, make seventeen and a half million dollars. That's what he does. It's just behind, like he's just thinking about everything else but the pitch that's coming right now, because he's doing. He's late on everything. He was late on a three-one fastball a couple days ago. I'm like, how are we late? What are we waiting for? What, what's the what's the game plan there? That's the thing that gets me mad with these White Sox hitters. Like count situation they're not thinking of what's going on what the pitcher is trying to get you into to induce to what his offerings are and what you're gonna do that guy is just lost at the plate he doesn't know what to do he has no idea no clue which is funny because it does seem like their team approach has been better and I don't know if that has to deal with even Martin Maldonado's game planning maybe they're able to even game plan better uh, from a hitting standpoint again they're not chasing as many pitches as they used to so that should be a good thing is it just that they've they also got have, a, they've also got a half of the lineup is brand new well, that's true yeah. <laughs> um, and three guys are out too which forces guys up is it just that these guys aren't athletic enough to be driving the ball like is it just a, a an issue of guys right now like Let's more focus on Lenin Sosa and, and Braden Shoemake. Are these guys that need to be on the roster right now, are they guys that maybe should be going down and getting more work in AAA because they aren't, you know, these these presents at the plate? Lenin Sosa and Braden Shoemake don't really seem like five hitters. Like, he's, Lenin Sosa's been slotted in. Is it worth going and testing out a veteran at those positions, I don't even know who I mean, that'd be. Elvis Andrews, bring him back. Well, well, Danny Mindick is down in the minor leagues. I think he's got like five or six home runs himself. I mean, he's a little long on the tooth as far as a person that you're thinking of for the future. So I would rather give these at bats to people who might be here. Danny Mindick, at the end of the day, is a fifth infielder at best. And so if you're just trying to improve the offense by that incrementally, yeah, Denny Mendick is a better hitter than both Braden Shoemake and Lenin Sosa. But I think that, yeah, you just have a team that they focus, like hyper-focused on the defense where they kind of forgot about, oh, can these guys hit at all? And you said it yesterday, like Robbie Grossman gets on base, but he doesn't swing the bat that much. It's a valuable tool to get on base, but also after a while they're gonna be like, okay, you're not swinging. Here's a fastball down the middle. Cool, go sit your ass down. So yeah, I would say there's nobody down in the farm system right now that is a prototypical five hitter that is also ready to play. But I would replace the people that they're starting right now, where Paul DeYoung gets like half of the time. I'll be playing him all the time. You signed him to a major league deal. You've seen the Braden Chumik thing. It's not good. And for leaning Sosa, I would send him back down in the minors and bring up Danny Mendick, who can actually put a little juice into the ball if you're looking for a little bit more offense. I mean, 
That's that's where that's where we're at. It's bad. <laughs> it's really bad. You've seen this team. I have. It's up r- close and it's personal. Really piss, like it's been good. It's really piss poor. No, but it's I guess I'm just saying. Horrendous. I guess I'm just saying. We let's put it this way. You you said you'd rather see those at bats go to younger guys. Yes, because their big fix for the offense right now is signing Tommy Pham, right, and mm-hmm. bringing him up, and potentially down the road that's going to. It's likely to take away at bats from Dominic Fletcher. It's likely to take away at bats from Oscar Colas if they had any interest in calling him up, which eventually they might. But um, you know, if you're talking about oh, you got to play Danny Mendick every day, what are, what are they doing, right? I mean, that's the, the other the are, the other part of this question is not you know because we're talking about short term fixes, right? Yeah. The other part of the question is long term fixes. Yep. And while I'm not gonna sit here and tell you that. If you start Braden Shoemake 95 times this year, he's going to turn into the third baseman of the future. I don't think that's a thing that's going to happen. But at the same time, what is benefiting this team right now over giving playing time for giving playing time to Danny Mendick, right? Yeah. I Maybe they get a couple more hits uh, every week. You know what I mean? Like, is that is that worth is that worth sacrificing any? Any percent chance of future success at the moment? But I guess I just, I'm not sold on Braden Shoemake future success. And we even talked about at spring training, it seemed like Mendick would be making the 26 man roster, mainly because Shoemake was dealing with an injury. And then it seemed like he kind of rebounded miraculously from that injury and was able to be on the opening day roster. I feel like that might have just been a mistake, and Shoemake had a really nice first swing with the White Sox and that went over the, uh, the, the yard. But I, I don't think that it was that. I don't think it was the right move because especially they talked about Shoemaker's speed and he just we have not seen that at all. He hasn't been on base. <laughs> right. So, I mean, that, that's the issue. You know, I'd, I'd like to see at least a little bit more something from Shoemaker because even, even uh, what he provides in the field is a little lackluster. So it's like, yeah, I, I, don't, mean, I don't. I don't. I don't know. Not, he's not the guy to be having this argument over. Obviously, he has not been very impressive. But. I'd like cleaner baseball. I guess right. it seems like yeah. Chris Getz has talked about. You know, we want guys that do the things right and I think Mendick can do things more correctly than Shoemake and I, I understand the face that you're making but it's like you're not going to go sign Evan Longoria and he's going to be your third baseman like you know it's it's Brandon Belt uh Donovan Solano Evan Longoria Bad. Manny Pena Tommy Listella Darren Ruff any of this Tyler Naquin again any anyone no no oh, okay Tyler right. Naquin again um, so I, I mean I, I think I don't know. I wouldn't hate Mendick over Shoemake, maybe even not Sosa, just because it gives you somebody who I think has a lower floor than Shoemake. I think Shoemake really doesn't know what to do when he struggles in the major leagues because he's never been there. Mendick has. Let's go to the other side of the diamond. Andrew Vaughn. Gavin Sheets can play first base. I don't know if I really want to see him in right field. We know that if he plays right field, that might make things a little bit more difficult for Tommy Pham getting playing time or Dominic Fletcher getting playing time. Andrew Vaughn has three options. Is it ridiculous to throw out the idea of Andrew Vaughn going down to AAA to try to work on things and maybe get a little bit more confidence because there's been talk, too, about his leg kick and getting timing down? Maybe you go do that against AAA pitching and you try to get your swag back. I mean, similar things have happened across Major League Baseball, right? I mean, if, if Andrew Vaughn were to go back down to the minors, or if the, if the White Sox were to put make the decision to send Andrew Vaughn to the minors, they would not be the first team to do that with a highly touted prospect, with a high draft pick, with a guy who is declared to be part of the long-term plan, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, it happens maybe not every year to that degree, but it has happened with relative frequency uh, across the game. That being said... What sort of, you know, you got to weigh the the confidence part of it, right? And, I mean, if this is a guy who's struggling right now, does his confidence get affected more by continuing to struggle? Or does his confidence get affected more by a, even if it's it's the opposite case, right, that we're sending you down because we believe in you and we want, we need you to be better so you can be part of the long-term plan here, does it, is it read in a different way and does that confidence uh, end up hurt because of it? I'm not sure, and I think that uh, Andrew Vaughn has long been described as somebody who is, uh, you know, pretty even keeled and has a pretty good understanding of things. So I'm I'm not sure that would be uh, a huge negative in in the confidence department to to make that move. Um, but you don't want to overreact to us to to a small sample, right? And we're not even a full month into the season yet. Um, this is a season where could be allowed to struggle because you're not the expectations are not uh 
on, hey, we need you to be right because we're chasing the division or we're chasing a World Series kind of thing. It, it, it seems like maybe the the circumstances are right to allow him to keep doing this for a little while longer until you discover, oh, this is hurting his development, him being up here and not being able to master this. There is development that still needs to occur, and it might need to occur down below. I mean, remember, while no one, Andrew probably included, was like thrilled with what he did last year, he was an above-average major league hitter. He, is, he, wasn't, he wasn't screaming last year, they need to find an alternative for this, or he doesn't know what he's doing. That was, that was not the read, even if he wasn't living up to expectations, right? So I think right now you've got a few weeks of him being uh, frighteningly poor from, you know, from, the, from the results perspective. Um, but if they see everything behind the scenes that they, thought, that they saw last year, and if they see um, a way out of this for him, you know, Guys go. Guys have really bad slumps sometimes. That's just kind of the nature of baseball. Uh, we'll see, though, if they determine that it's a development thing. I don't think that move. And, and again, I have no information or inkling of whether they would ever even consider doing that. But if that move were to happen, I don't think it would be. I don't think it would be this shocking, earth-shattering thing because you do see it across across the game. And I think also by if he continues on this path that he has been on where he's hitting below 200, has no home runs, really no, driven nobody in in a position pow, position of power. Yeah, you think about sending him down there, not only for his sake, but for the rest of the organization's sake, because you can't have a first baseman struggling like that and staying on the team. To me, that as a player on that team, I would say, why does that guy get all this favorite status where – Oscar Colas, you know, did similar things last year, and he was sent down immediately. I know it's more complicated than just the numbers with Oscar Colas, but then as, as a player in that organization, you need some consistency. So if Andrew Vaughn is struggling and he can't do the things that he is getting paid to do, yeah, a demotion to AAA might be a thing that both benefits him and benefits the organization – because you have a person in Gavin Sheets that should be getting those at bats when Tommy Pham comes up here and Aloy's still here. So I would say that if he is on this track and he continues there, I would see him definitely going down to the minor leagues. And I think he's a professional enough to realize that, yeah, I'm not doing the job, and he wouldn't take it personally. I hope he would just go down to Charlotte in that band box and mash and get whatever timing he needs to get down and then come back up to the major leagues ready to go. Yeah, and he's obviously had a funny just minor league career. Uh, the first time he ever saw Charlotte was on a rehab stint in 2022, uh, and he liked Charlotte. Uh, seven at-bats, two hits, two homers. Uh, so, I mean, that's pretty good. I mean, if we saw some pop, he doesn't have a single homer yet. Uh, like, I mean, that's just the biggest thing is we don't really see him jumping on pitches. You don't really see him maybe feeling confident versus a pitcher it's more of I really have to lay off anything away like especially against a right-hander I have to lay off any slider that's away and I thought it was funny that he was going up against sinker yesterday or not sinker uh singer yesterday who throws a sinker uh and that's confusing the first yes it is uh <laughs> Lennon DJ got confused with that yesterday uh the first pitch that he saw was a slider that was a called strike in the zone and then he sees the same pitch but it's outside of the zone and I think he's like oh well it's the same pitch I got to commit to it and yeah. then you know this one's a, a worse pitch to swing at it's like yeah. you should have picked the first one um, it does seem like he's always getting behind against pitchers and pitchers are able to really let the bat unfold how they want to against Andrew Vaughn and he's really never able to you know flip it uh, against a hitter uh, Connor did bring up Chris Young, uh, the former outfielder that the Sox traded to Arizona, uh, when he was 25, he got sent down in 2009 to AAA and then made it back up to the major leagues and then later became a all-star with Oakland, right? Yeah, no, I'll start with, with the Diamondbacks. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, uh, so maybe he's a Chris Young, but if you're comparing Chris Young and Andrew Vaughn, I think Chris Young's probably fairly more athletic. Uh, so, you know, well, center fielder, just a yeah. little bit. Yeah. So I, 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 I think there's a little bit more hope that Chris Young could turn it around, but we'll see. Uh, maybe Andrew Vaughn uh, ends up getting sent down to AAA. Uh, let's take another break and then we'll uh, go into some free agent stuff in the long term. Want to let you know, though, about our friends over at Prize Picks. They're the largest daily fantasy sports platform in North America, and they're the easiest and most exciting way to play DFS. It's just you against the numbers. Instead of battling thousands of other players, including pros and sharks, you pick more than or less 
best then on two to six player stat projections and watch the winnings roll in. With spring training over, baseball season is officially underway, so don't miss your chance to add your favorite players from the diamond in your prize pick entries, whether it's strikeouts, RBIs, or first inning runs. Take your pick of more than or less than and add them to your prize pick entry today. And you can also elevate your watching experience with the NBA playoffs and play out Play in rounds beginning. Uh, there are no games tonight, but tomorrow you'll have the conclusion of the Western Conference matchup, which I guess is not the Warriors because they got their butts kicked. It's the Kings and the other team. Pelicans? Pelicans. Pelicans. Mr. Basketball. Go. Yeah, look at Mr. Basketball. And then Mr. You'll, also, Hoops. you'll also get the Heat and the Bulls uh, tomorrow. So if you're looking to elevate your watching experience, download the Prize Picks app, and they have everything for, or they have something for every sports fan, for baseball and basketball, to League of Legends and everything in between. You could pick from LeBron, Shohei Otani, Connor McDavid, and Jude Bellingham all in the same entry. And it's as easy as making an entry in less than 60 seconds. You can just pick two of your favorite players, pick more than or less than, and then you could submit it right before the game starts. So go to prizepicks.com slash CHGO and use code CHGO for a first deposit match up to $100. That's prizepicks.com slash CHGO and use code CHGO. G-O, pick more, pick less. It's that easy. Charlie the Bacon Guy is based out of Woodridge, Illinois, and he makes craft bacon and bacon jams in over 35 different flavors. Bacon and bacon jams are naturally cured, preservative-free products. No ingredients that Charlie cannot pronounce himself are involved in the process, unlike most store-bought brands. A thoroughbate or sodium acerbate, for example. This bacon is vacuum-sealed and freezes perfectly. Bacon lasts up to 60 days in the package, in the refrigerator, and one week after the seal is broken, and nine months in the freezer. Bacon jam lasts about 90 days in the fridge and up to one year in the freezer. But if you're keeping the bacon and the bacon jam in the freezer, you're doing it wrong. Check out all the awesome merch, as Steven's showing you right now, on Charlie's page, charliethebaconguy.com. They have beanies, hats, T-shirts, stickers, coffee mugs, etc. The bacon jam goes perfectly on anything. Put it on scrambled eggs, toast, crackers, burgers, grilled cheese, charcuterie board, cinnamon rolls, pizza, or Charlie's favorite, the spoon. And the Bacon Vault has all the flavors that Charlie's made in the past. If it's not currently available, give Charlie about two weeks and he'll make it for you. Some of the flavors he has going around right now, ranch, rosemary, vanilla bourbon, maple espresso, Cajun, Jardinera, Canadian bacon, which is a new item. And the Bacon Jam flavors are original bourbon and cherry jalapeno. Starting now, you can save 10% on your order at charliethebaconguy.com when you use the code CHGOSOX. So CHGO Socks at checkout. You can pick it up, which is the most efficient way for you, or he can deliver it to you, or meet you halfway, or even ship it. He makes the bacon so you can bring it home. Follow him on Instagram at charliethebaconguy or at Twitter, CZ the Bacon Guy. The email is charliethebaconguy at gmail.com. Or the website is charliethebaconguy.com. And he's crazy. He's injecting stuff. Like, yeah, I mean, th- this man is taking photos of, like, needles into bacon. Like, Mad scientist. Like, literally. I mean, he and, and it's it's crazy. What I'll tell you what. With. Buffalo I'll bacon? You I'll tell you what, Wimpy. <laughs> Buffalo bacon? That sounds very good. They got a lot of my money in, Woodridge. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, Connor does mention he wishes that we had Chris Young patrolling center field for the late 2000s to set us two seasons of half game uh, Javi Vasquez, I will say, where was Chris Young July 7th uh, or July 29th, 2009, right? Where was he at? He was, was not on the White Sox. So, uh, it sounds like he was in the minor 23rd. leagues. If we're or July 23rd. I think you're talking about well, yeah, He I, was not there. Yeah, he was He was playing uh, in Arizona against the Pittsburgh Pirates going 0 for 5. And, and do you think he had the swag, the confidence in a perfect game when Gabe Kapler hits one out into the gap? to go up and climb the wall and make the catch? No. no. Only Dwayne Wise could do that. So I don't I don't know about that, Connor. I might take Javi Vasquez instead of Chris Young because then maybe we don't get the perfect game. And, hey, congrats to uh, Mark Burley on this day 17 years ago. You got the no-hitter against the Texas Rangers. So, you know, it's always fun to reminisce because Wasn't that's when the really, White Sox were really good. cold? Really cold. Yeah. Really yeah, cold. night game. I remember that game vividly. Sammy Sosa got picked off first after he walked. And then I got to uh, – and then someone reshared the entire – inning today so do you know how long that final inning was that ninth inning was 20 a seconds minute. <laughs> three minutes okay <laughs> three minutes and, really? then the, and then there was like a I minute 20, 20 sec- of celebrating I guess 20 seconds is probably a little yeah. little hyperbolic but i mean it's it's crazy to watch because it's even quicker than 
now the yeah. actual pitch clock i mean the second and it's nelson cruz he's not hitting a homer against the white Sox, so it's very surprising but the second nelson cruz like starts to rest in his batting stance there goes mark burley into his uh his his motion and it's just it's crazy to watch there's no one like it uh put him in the hall of fame anyways uh long term i think it's going to be very interesting to see how much money and how much flexibility chris gets gets to spend and there was an uh, a article that i saw today pop up on my timeline from 2019, this is from Sox Machine, so Jim Margulis wrote this, about Rick Hahn's free agent classes. In 2013, he had $16.3 million. He used that to sign Jeff Kepinger to a three-year, $12 million Oof. deal, and then Matt Lindstrom to a two-year, $4.3 million a year. Who? Matt Lindstrom. Wow. Uh, Lever. <laughs> wow. Lindstrom put up .7 war. Jeff Kepinger put up negative 1.9. So that's a grand total of 16.3 million for negative 1.2 war. That is very bad. That's a good, that's a, they'd be very <laughs> adept. They the DFA, Jeff Kepinger. Yes. Uh, in 2014, uh, they spent $77 million, but thankfully 68 of that was on Jose Abreu. Then they spent $2 million on Felipe, Pauli, Felipe Paulino, yeah. uh, $4 million on Scott Downs, and $3 million on Ronald Belisario. Uh, and that was a grand total of 19 war. If you take out uh, Jose Abreu's uh, 21.2 war, I think that would become a negative two number. So that's very fun. Uh, in 2015, they got to spend $96.5 million for a grand total of 9.3 war. They spent 12 on Adam LaRoche. They spent uh, 42 on Melky Cabrera. He mm. gave him 4.6 war. Giovanni Soto, $1.5 million. Emilio Bonifacio, $3 million. Gordon Beckham, $2 million. Zach Duke, $7 million. And then David Robertson, uh, $29 million. So $96.5 million. They got 9.3 war. 2016, Deonor Navarro got $4 million. Alex Avila got $2.5 million. Austin Jackson got $5 million. Jimmy Rollins got $2 million. Matt Latos got $3 million. Grand total of $16.5 million for negative 0.2 war. 2017, they only spent $6 million on Derek Holland for negative 1.6 war. 2018, they spent $19.75 million on Wellington Castillo, Miguel Gonzalez, and Hector Santiago for negative 1.3 war. In 2019, they spent $19 million, uh, and they got negative 0.6 war from Kelvin Herrera, John Jay, James McCann, and Irvin Santana. We didn't get the uh, the fully updated Dallas Keuchel, Yasmani Grandal, y'all Grandal years as well. But I mean, the biggest issue that I saw, and we continue to see with the White Sox, even with the Andrew Benatendi signing, is you're signing a guy for seventy five million dollars, and he's putting up negative WAR. You're not even getting a positive contribution from these free agent classes. If Chris Getz is able to actually sign the right free agents, maybe there is more of a plan. Maybe Brian Bannister's idea of how pitchers and certain pitch types work in a bullpen or you know in a rotation, uh, maybe a, a grander vision could lead to more success because it really did seem like every single free agent class that Rick Hahn had failed. And he was allowed, allowed to spend a decent amount of money each and every year. Well, and I'll say this too. it it You're saying there might be a better chance of it going right. It has to go right because – the way that Rick Hahn acquired the majority of the talent that the last rebuild was was centered around was through trades yep. and was through, you know, obviously they signed Luis Robert Jr. at one point. That was an international free agent signing. But the, the Chris Sale trade, the Jose Quintana trade, and the Adam Eaton trade provided a lot of the core of what was supposed to be a team that was going to be contending for, for years to come. They don't have that right now. They don't have those guys to trade. Is my point, and so um, they do. They they already made the trade for Dil, of Dylan Cease. There's two. There's two pitchers there, and may, and maybe down the road, you know, if Slam and Sammy Zavala turns into something, you know, we'll see. But he's a young guy. Uh, you know, I think your focus is obviously on Thorpe and Iriarte. Those guys have to be good because that was one of because the opportunities to cash in were so few for Chris Getz on the roster currently. I was talking with somebody the other day, and they brought up the idea to me, does this team have to trade Luis Robert Jr. at some point? And we talked about it during the offseason, and we said, oh, four years of control, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. You know, he's a guy that you build around other than this. But is there anybody else that Chris Getz can trade for a uh, impactful return? And, and maybe at the trade deadline, there will be, right? Maybe somebody will have a good three, four months of the season, and there will be somebody that he's able to turn into something else. But right now, there is not this group of one, two, three guys who other teams really, really want, like Rick Hahn was able to trade, to turn into a 
large number of potential players in the farm system. Right now, Chris Getz has brought in Thorpe. He's brought in Iriarte. They have Montgomery. They have Ramos. They have Caro. And they've got a lot of pitchers from last trade deadline. But where are those position players? If you're making a one of those lineups of the future that we all were so fond of doing back in you know 2018, right? How many guys are even able to put on that lineup card right now, right? Yeah. I mean, you, I just listed about four of them, may, and, that's, and that's assuming – that's including Robert, and it's assuming that Brian Ramos and Edgar Caro pan out, right? Yep. I mean, Colson Montgomery is a top-10 prospect right now. That's a guy, absolutely. But you, you really need some of these other guys to hit. You need the player development group to start developing guys that we're not even talking about right now. Um, it is not – an easy path to the next good White Sox team because the resources that Rick Hahn had to replenish the farm system, Chris Getz does not have. Multiple things. Uh, Luis Robert thing, I would, if I was the White Sox, di think differently. I know he signed with Scott Boris, but I would look at Luis and say, hey, man, look at Matt Chapman. Look at Jordan Montgomery. Look at Blake Snell. Look at all the people yet you are – aligned with because you had the same agent they didn't get the deals that they wanted and i know that you want to go and get the most money you can get you got three and a half years left in your deal you got hurt today this year this could go away here's an extension for you luis robert bunch of money and see if he bites because he can see that people are not getting the money that they might have thought they were in when it's coming to free agency. So if you're the White Sox, I would do everything I can to keep him. But if he's not amenable to a trade or to a extension of his contract right now, yeah, I would think about at the trade deadline with three and a half years left of Luis Robert, maybe if you can get the value, trading him. That's for more of a long-term solution. But also, you just listed out all those uh, free agents that Rick Hahn signed. None of those were top ten free agents. None of those free agents were other teams were sought after those players. Like, there's 10 teams looking to get that player. Like, the best of those was, like, David Robertson. Maybe Melky, Melky? Cabrera. Yeah. But he was three years for, like, $15 million each year. It wasn't a good, like, break the bank. We don't see a lot of those. I, but that's what I'm saying. I mean, that's what I'm saying. You have people out there this year with Pete Alonso and Juan Soto. And these are pipe dreams, yes, but... You got to change from who you are. You're the worst team in baseball, worst organization in baseball. Go out and try to sign Cody Bellinger. I know they came up just short of Zach Wheeler, but you have to pay a White Sox tax for these players to come here. Pay much more than what the other teams are offering. And that's how you change the fortunes because then you sign those guys that are fine. You get negative war seasons. You get the Andrew Benintendi's of the world because they're fine and they're affordable to you. How about you go and, go and get an expensive person that you know is going to put up numbers no matter what? Yes, he's going to cost $25 million or $30 million, But in today's baseball, $30 million is nothing. Like, you're paying Manny Machado that right now. You're paying Bryce Harper that right now. You could have been paying those guys if you were willing to spend some money. Instead of doing this nickel-dime stuff, you're paying $18 million to Andrew uh, Benintendi. Are you getting any type of semblance of that $18 million? No. So change your direction of how you go out and get free agents and change – how you look at free agents at the top of the list, not the middle or the bottom of the list, like they've been doing for the rest of, for the, ever since I've been alive, except for Albert Bell. That's the, like the only marquee free agent that I can think of that they went and got off the top of the free agent list. And and I'll say this too: there have been times, you know, this is obviously a recurring complaint, as you just brought up. It's been your whole your whole life, Herb. This is a recurring complaint among White Sox fans that they don't spend as much in free agency. In at least recent years past, I've said I've I've argued at times like, oh, the reason they're they don't have to do that is because they've look at all these guys they've got. They've got Luis Robert and Yoan Moncada and Aloy Jimenez and Tim Anderson and Giolito and 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 you know all these guys they got ceased. Now they don't have that anymore. Nope. And so if they don't go out and spend money on free agents next year, you, the alternative is not, oh, our homegrown core will power us to success. The alternative is this season again, right? Yep. Because, I mean, this is the, this is the, this is the season in which now the core is gone or about to be gone in, in the case of likely Moncada and Deloy, and 
the where is the minor leaguers to back it up? We just went through everything. You know, yeah, they got some good pitching prospects, but the offense is not uh, promising, right? So they went out and bought or, or and signed a bunch of guys to one year deals this year. Maybe it's to get them to next off season when the Moncada money comes off the books, when the Alloy money comes off the books. But if you don't then spend that money on free agents, where are you? You don't have that alternative of oh, we'll do it ourselves with our with our guys, and it'll be and it'll be great. And because you know that could have happened, it didn't, but it could have happened. Now saying we'll do it with who we got right here is playing Lenin Sosa every day and play. You know what I mean? And talking about um, uh, you know how you know playing Corey Lee all the time. Not that he's doing poorly; he's doing fine. But mm-hmm. these are not the top of the list guys nope. that that Moncada. Jimenez, Robert, Anderson, all once were. Yeah, 13 of their 30 are position players uh, of the MLB top 30 prospects. So a lot of pitching heavy uh, prospects in their current organization right now. And I think looking at the Russ Dorsey piece that came out today uh, from Yahoo, him mentioning that they've been a top 10 team in team payroll just once in the past 10 years is obviously something that frustrates me. Mainly when you're a team that's not receiving the benefits of small market teams, yep. right? You're getting damaged in the 2025 draft because you aren't a small market team because you do spend enough to be seen as a bigger market team. You're not a part of uh, market sharing, right? Uh, and the one thing too, like they've been a top 10 team in t- uh, team payroll just once in the past 10 years where the team that has won the World Series was in the top 10 eight of those years, which is cool, sick. Um, and uh, again, like they can't pick in the, the top 10 next year because they already have uh, the fifth pick in the 2024 draft, even though they're going to be terrible and likely a lottery team. They don't have the ability to jumpstart it with a, you know, a top five pick in 2025 as well. Along with Jerry's comments, what he brought up in August, we're not going to spend $300 million for a pitcher. It seems like their angle is let's develop all of our pitching, right? Let's go find the weird guys that we can you know dust off and maybe turn into something like Chris Lexon or Mike Soroka uh, but then let's try to turn and use all six of the years that we have of team control and try to turn out just great pitchers right and I think that they're doing that with Nostrini I think they're doing that with uh, Cannon as well and Getz also in that Dorsey P said there's different ways of going through these kinds of transition or phases in the past teams capitalize on getting high draft picks on a regular basis or trading certain players with a certain amount of service time left you need to find those competitive advantages I don't think there's a competitive advantage to trading a Luis Robert Jr. I think what the advantage at least to the White Sox is is that you have again the money to spend so spending that and maximizing that money I think to should be to the Sox full fullest advantage and that's not spending on bullpen arms like we saw giving you know just for the example I brought up Kelvin Herrera two years 18 million right like go spend that on a bat that's going to play 150 games uh if you're going to go spend 77 million well why not you know go spend 77 million on a left fielder that will be a cornerstone obviously Benintendi wasn't that and that's a flaw of the the past front office but if you're going to have the money that they have maybe having a more concerted direction and effort of being like we're going to upgrade our lineup with the money that we're going to spend and all of our in-house acquisitions or all of our in-house uh growing will be on the pitching side like I I don't really know if they're going to become a factory that's churning out bats if that makes sense like it seems like you're going to have a budget that's going to be a hundred plus million go sign some bats because especially with Moncada Aloy coming off you can spread that money around that what 30 plus million dollars around and try to get, you know, two or three guys. And, and there you go. Hey, you got a, you got what? One third of a lineup there. What's that 38 million available between those two? There's just 13 just, plus 25. Yeah. Just available. That sounds like a Juan Soto bet. Let's go. Hey, you said it, not me. <laughs> hey, uh, but like, seriously, I mean, I know he won't come here, but damn. No, come but on, I mean, the, the Harper thing is the one that just frustrates me the most is because like, literally you look at how much he's getting paid now. Um, and hey, who, who wouldn't want $20 million out of, out of the three of us? Well, I'll take 20 million, but still like you're paying. I'll just take 1 million. Yeah, right. You're paying yeah. Bryce Harper <laughs> 20 million a year. Like that just seems like stealing. That seems wrong. It seems like you're doing something unfair and the White Sox were there and they just didn't feel like pushing the envelope. And I just, I hope that they push the envelope when they're in those situations. And I think maybe if they know that they can push the envelope because their, their, their objective is to sign big bats, like maybe they'll get there. Maybe just 
maybe. And Shohei and his agency have given the blueprint for how you can sign a player and not be as painful to you in the immediate future. Like, Jerry won't own this team probably 20 years from now. I hope he lives that long. But you can have that deal where it's 10 years, but most of it's deferred. Get it back there. So whoever takes the team over after Jerry uh, sells it, that's their problem type of thing where you're just paying them a little bit money, money this year, a decent amount, but it's available so you can sign other players on top of that. That's what Shohei wanted the Dodgers to do. Get creative, White Sox. Do something to get these guys in here and actually producing because we've been over the lineup. Like that Andrew Benintendi thing's not working. I know they're not going to eat that. He's going to be playing for the next two years on the White Sox, guaranteed. Maybe that fifth year they'll eat it, but the next two years he's going to be playing. So you got to you have to overdo that. You have to get a right fielder that's going to hit many more home runs and do some for Andrew Benintendi too, and then get a first baseman that's going to hit. If that's Andrew Vaughn, baby, I would love that. It's cheap. It's in house. You don't have to spend a much bunch of money. But if Pete Alonso is available, hey Amen. I, I would get I that would, man. I would hate. No, I'd hate if they went and spent it on Pete Alonso because you're just going and getting a first baseman. I get it's 50 home runs, but yes. I mean you're going out and paying a first baseman premium money. I mean, I, I would like you know maybe a yeah, shortstop so, or a second baseman or a, yes. a right fielder. Pete, Pete Alonso is good. Yes. Pete Alonso yes. is good. I never said yeah. He was it'll just be, in. It'd be um, great to yeah. get a second shortstop, but those people are usually signed. Uh, yeah, no, that's that's fair. Uh, Trey Turner hit the market though. You never know. Uh, all right, uh, let's wrap this up. I did, yeah, I'll get to that question from referee in a second. I wanted to address Chicago, though, by saying I'm looking at your guys' merch so I can sit on camera like the loop guy does in home games. Wow, so he's if just you do the that, loop do guy it, now? I guess. Nice. Uh, I think he also has a lot B shirt. Uh, but, hey, Chicago, if you do do that, uh, I would suggest the Southside Script one, the black CHGO one. But if you do that, let us know that you're going to the game and you're going to be trying to sit behind a camera and we'll try to it's, screenshot, screenshot it. it. It's right there on the on the YouTube you're watching right now. You could say it shows you all the available options for merch. If you just hit that drop down box. There you go. I've been there multiple times. Up selling herb. Yeah. Uh, all right. Let's go to the uh, start comment from referee 538, right? Uh, 583. Random question. I'm coming to Chicago for four days. What do I do? Or what do, what do I want to be doing? Uh, as a huge White Sox fan before and after the game. Yeah, I'm, I may have led him astray a little bit and told him to buy a Paul DeYoung jersey. So you Don't guys could that. probably give better suggestions than that. I mean, he's got a 600 slugging percent right now. It five hits in, in the doubleheader yesterday, All right, Steve. maybe I didn't lead him astray. Yeah, I see you all the he, way. He buy the Paul DeYoung hitter. jersey. I mean, go to a tailgate. Find one of the bars, you know, either Ballpark Pub that I went to or uh, Turtles or – Cork at the park. All those places are good to spend before the game, and then go into the game hour after hour and a half before the game when the gates open, because you're gonna need to because the lines are really long. If you don't, if you wait thirty minutes before the game, because it's dumb, and then just sample some of the delicious food, not the campfire milkshake, just a regular hot dog, just grilled onions, hot dog, mustard, whatever you want to put on. If you want to put ketchup on it. It's going to be frowned upon, but it's your mouth, so eat it. I say you got to go a little further afield than that mm -hmm. because there's there's good stuff in Bridgeport. Okay, you Go down 35th Phil's. Street to Antique Taco. You go a little further down, down 35th Street to Phil's, which you know I love. It's one yeah. of my favorite pizza places in the city. Uh, how about Mars Brewing? Yeah. Down 35th Street. How about you go up to 31st Street and go to Maria's? Yep. I mean, these Average are these minutes. are top-notch places. Uh, Pilsen is fantastic, not too far away. Chinatown is fantastic, not too far away. Uh, the South Side's got plenty of fantastic places to check out. Connie's Pizza is right there in Chinatown. I think, too, if you're downtown, I mean, you should check out the Art Museum. I think I think that's just Oh, yeah, if you're the, doing tourist Sox stuff, right? absolutely. Does yeah. it have to be White Sox stuff? He said he's going to be in the in Chicago for four days. Sure. He's just going to be go sitting the whole, go from 31st the whole, to 39th. Go, go to the city. Go days. to the Shed Aquarium. Yeah, there you go. I mean, I, I don't know. You know, st stretch out. See what this the city has to do. I mean, I, I, I think just doing some, some Chicago stuff wouldn't lead you astray because then you got to go watch the White Sox. So it's like you got to balance it with the, the bad and the good, you know? And I don't know if your hometown has a lovely waterfront, but we have the lakefront. How about you just That's go true. top to bottom? Yeah. Get a bike. Hollywood all the way down to Jackson Park. <laughs> Boom. Yeah, you can ride a, a divvy bike all the way down. Whole way. Uh, I'm going to do that this summer. That's on my summer to-do list. Are you do stopping? The, doing the lakefront trail top to bottom. Okay. 
You stopping at places? On a bike or what? On a bike. Okay. okay. Yeah, on a divvy bike. You're not going to Forrest Gump it and walk it? Well, I mean, I've done that before. Oh, okay. I mean, I haven't oh, done it that point to point, but I mean, like, the long walk I've done, I want to do the bike ride next. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, hey, let us know. Just like when uh, our guy uh, Chicago sits behind the, the plate with a CHGO shirt. Let us know when you're, you're <laughs> biking. From... You'll send a drone out to yeah, follow me around? That'd be bike fun. in the drive, but not the drive. All right. Uh, only other thing I have to throw out there uh, is uh, something I think Vinny will like, and uh, shout out to Jordo. Who in the chat? Who says shout out me, Sean? Before it ends, uh, Davey Andrews on Fangraphs put together how many times have MLB players heard center field by John Fogarty? <laughs> so the average major league player has heard center field by John Fogarty how many times? Well, the average major league player, average major so league player, including international. I can guarantee you that it is played before every minor league baseball every. game. In every minor league baseball stadium known to man. Yes. So I will say that's what? How long is a minor league baseball season? Like 120 games, something like that? Something like that. Yeah. So 120 times the average major league player, let's say, is down in the minors four or five years. Okay. That's 6,000 or something, 600 or something like that games. Uh, then major league. I'll, I'll say that the answer is over 1,000. I'll say 1,500. Okay. Your, your math is just a little off. <laughs> So, for international players, uh, including international players, it's 354.2 times. That's the average times that, including international players, they've heard John Fogarty center field. Uh, but at least for minor leagues, 4.45 or 4.45 years, there's 75 games, 40% of the games, that's 142. Why is 75 games? I, I, don't, I don't, it says it in here. Um... I, um because I don't think it's every home like it's I don't think they're saying every just the the home games they're talking about. I estimate 80 games per player each year. So I guess because it's not all A A double A triple A are the, the same amount. Okay. If you're in Arizona, you might not be hearing it as much. So 80 was more of a guesstimate. And then the major league level was of 4.83 years, 191 games, and that's 110 times. Uh, so the total, grand total in a, an American-born player's life, 418 times. That's short. I think that's I've, low. I've heard of that song more than a yes. thousand times, oh, and I don't even play. As someone who at some as someone who worked at a minor league baseball stadium for about four, about a similar number of years, I bet I've heard it oh. over well over a thousand times. You're also seeking it out, though. I think. disagree. Don't like that song. No, okay. that's a terrible. As much song. as I love Creedence Clearwater Revival. Solo John Fogarty, no thank you. Yeah, yeah, once that song comes on or Hotel California, I'm like, nope. Oh, that we're, song, we're that good. song I love. Off. <laughs> <laughs> uh, That's, if you, you if you move to California, you'll hear it every damn day. It's annoying. You can check out any time you like, but you can never leave. Her. On, on a dark desert highway, you'll find Vinny Duber. You can follow him at Vinny Duber. He's our CHGO White Sox beat writer. Uh, the man in the middle is Herb Lawrence. You can follow him at Ector Wall 23. He's our CHGO White Sox community leader. You can follow me at Sean underscore W underscore Anderson. Thank you to Steven, Mr. Hockey slash football slash Mr. Baseball for producing the show. Hit that thumbs up button and make sure you're subscribing to the CHGO Sports YouTube channel. We'll talk to you on Sunday. Goodbye. <laughs> Y'all silly like the mayor.